Okay, uh, if you've got a Bible, we're going to start in Matthew, but we're going to go to Jonah after that as well. Okay, so uh, maybe find them both now so you can get to Jonah. Jonah's a bit of a hard one to find. It's like about four pages in your Bible, kind of hidden. Um, so yeah, Matthew um, chapter 7, um, verse 7, yeah, 7-7. Seven, seven. Just while you're finding that, I just want to encourage you that Matthew 5, 6, and 7, um, the Beatitudes, um, I was reading through a little bit of it this week, and uh, there's so much in there. So it's, it's good. It's good. There's a good word pretty much on, on every line there. But there's so much there for, for how to operate as Christians, how to operate even as churches. It's all in there. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, we'll look at that a lot more over the, the coming year. But um, if you want a bit of homework, go read them. Go and read those, those, those three chapters um, and just be encouraged. Everything you probably need to know um, just to help you and encourage you in your walk with God is in there. Okay. So verse 7, it says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who f- seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. They're saying amen right now, but you don't know what I'm about to preach. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) What man is there among you that if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Verse 13, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Wow. You're one of the few. Wow. You made it, right? And you're one of the few. That's incredible. You beat the odds. Because it says many. Many find the other path. Few find the narrow path. Who's on the narrow path? Is it easy? I can tell you it's not because it says it's difficult in the word. Okay? It's hard. But if you found it, man, you're in the minority. But you beat the odds. Because the odds said you should be walking on the wide one. Because that was the easiest one to go on. And most people follow it. If I said nothing else, that should encourage you. I'm all right. I'm good. Okay. Bye. Today's title is called, You Will Find What You Seek. And I'm going to just turn this passage a little bit away from it being this lovely passage of scripture that everyone just said amen to. Because you said amen completely justified in what would be in your heart at at that time. Because we're talking about seeking God, asking God, and knocking on the door of God, and, 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 and what comes with that. And we, we know what that looks like. But I want to I wanna just look at it from a different perspective. Because I believe that this word, and, and this, this, I don't know if this is a word for everyone today. I'm sure everyone will get something from it. But I believe that maybe this message is for somebody today. Whether they're online, whether they're in this room right now, or whether they watch this later, I think this is specific to somebody. Maybe there's a couple of somebodies there, but I I just think this is for someone. And I want to make space for at least that someone to to receive prayer at the end, to to be able to overcome what I'm going to go through and what I'm going to read through in a bit. So if everyone else that's here, Enjoy the ride, okay? Are you buckled in? Are you ready? You don't even know what's coming. Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm looking at you for the rest of this sermon. Okay. No one else is ready. Just you. No, in a nice way. Don't be scared. So if, you've got, um, if you're already there, go to the book of Jonah. And we're going to just work through this book quickly, as quickly as we can. Again, more homework. You want to read a book in the Bible and sound like you're, um, you know, like a, a good Christian? Read Jonah. It'll take you like two minutes. You say, I read a book this week in the Bible. Yeah, read Jonah. 
It, it won't take you long. Um, it's really, really quick. Four chapters, but short chapters. chapters. Um, but a lot in it. Okay, Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of um, Amitai, um, Amitai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare, and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Okay. So God asked Jonah, his prophet, to go to the great city of Nineveh. And actually to go there and cry out against it. To go there and actually tell them that God's not happy from what they're doing and actually judgment's on its way. Now the role of a prophet is to be a spokesperson for God and to do exactly this kind of thing. God says go, go and tell that person, go and tell this city, um, bring the message and, and they go and do this. <laughs> so Jonah, I think he's known as a reluctant prophet. Um, Jonah actually uh, says no. Yeah, so, so God says, can you go to Nineveh and tell them that I'm not happy with them? Cry out against them. And he says, nah. No, I'm not doing that. And, and, he, and, he, and he runs away from the presence of God. Now, what's amazing, and I'm going to open this up a little bit further on in the message. Do you know that Jonah doesn't actually disagree with the statement here? So when he says, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for the wickedness has come before me. He's not in disagreement with that statement. Okay? Think about it. God hasn't said anything else. Go and tell them that they're wicked. If you find out later, and we will find out later, Jonah is not in disagreement with God about that statement. And yet, he still runs from the presence of God. Why? As human beings, we do the strangest of things. I mean, the dumbest of things. When we have the wrong intentions. When we start out with the wrong intentions, we can end up in the weirdest craziest awful of places because of how we started how our mind was how 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 that that thought was birthed and what we did with it when i look at this story it's clear that in order for us to end up in a mess we need to deliberately choose a path that leads that way people don't like to hear this but there there is a thing called choice for the human race, okay? Who you are, what happens. Now, you may have circumstances that doesn't make choice easy, but everyone still has choice to do the right thing or not. Choice is always there for everyone. God has put that in there from the start. We know this, don't we? I, I mean, if you've had a, a child, um, you were a child, so you'll know this because you're naughty as well. But basically, uh, uh, a, a child, when they're born, does any parent train their kid to try and steal the cookies or to, you know, um, or to, to, to hit their sibling? I'm pretty sure none of us are there going, right, okay, you know, uh, uh, Felix, um, here's, your, your, here's, here's your new baby uh, brother, Rufus. Now, what you do is you get a good dead arm, right? What you do is you get a fist. And this is how, you know, you don't, I don't believe that you guys did that, did you? No? Okay, it's good. Okay, we don't train our kids to just hit one another or to maybe be dishonest you know like where's the chocolate gone well, i don't know and there are cakes in it you know so it's in every single one of us to choose to do the right thing obviously when you're younger you grow up to learn how to do that but it's still within us to know that we've done wrong even when we don't no one's ever really taught us to do wrong is that my finger? Someone's finger going. Something's vibrating over here. Hopefully it's not a bomb. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we'll be in a good place really soon. Okay. <laughs> so 
to end up in a mess, you have to deliberately choose to get there. Now think about this. First of all, he has a thought. Tashish sounds good. Which is effectively, if you're looking at a map, is the opposite direction to where God was telling him to go. So he's probably like, okay, if I went the opposite direction, what is that way? Okay, that's where I'm. It's in his thought. It's in his thought process. He then takes that thought and then he arrives at a place which gives him more chance of seeing that thought become a reality because to get to what is now in his head, he now has to board something to get there because you can't just walk there. So he has to go to a place to actually get the means to get to the place that he needs to. So it started with a thought that then started to move into, okay, how do I make this thought become a reality? Okay, to get to that place, to do that thing, to run from the presence of God, which is basically what he's choosing to do, he then had to take that thought, turn it into action. He then um, finds a place that will enable him to find a, 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 a vessel to get on. He then finds a way to get to his destination. He then pays for the journey. I think all this is in there for a reason. It's all there. Why put it in there? It could just say he got on a boat and went, you know. I think it's showing you the process that we all go through before we're even on the journey of fleeing from the presence of God. It's deliberate, you see. And, and as we seek things, not just God, when we seek things, which probably starts with a thought, there's a deliberate process that enables us. So when we think, how did I get to this place? How did I end up in this mess? Well, it started with a thought that became a deliberate action that put you to where you are now. Catch this. Go on, catch it. A thought, a thought is not sin. If a thought's sin, I mean, you might get things coming in your head. You might be like, God, just take that. I don't want that. You know, you might not feel great about what, what might... But if a thoughts are going to be coming to you for the rest of your life, you know that? You know, the enemy, has anyone ever just randomly been in a place where you're like, I feel I'm good with God, and you're running, and suddenly like a swear word or an image or something just comes, and you're like, I wasn't even fueling that. I wasn't even in a place, you know? Thoughts are always going to come, okay? Things are always going to drop in. Some of us have got past lives where there's stuff that is there that we can see. And there's sometimes just a randomness of the stuff that can just come from anywhere and end up in here. That's not the problem. It's what we do with it next that is. You know, David saw uh, Bathsheba and he thought, all righty. Yeah? Now... I think he's, I, I, think, I don't think he's done anything wrong at the point where he sees her because he's not trying to find her. He's not, I mean, don't think so anyway. I don't think he has binoculars and he's looking across, uh, you know, into ladies' bedrooms or anything like that. She is bathing, he's out there, and he's like, whoa. It starts with a thought. He sees something, it's tempting. Now he could just turn around and walk back into his castle or wherever he was, wherever he was at that point, and just be like, Take a breath, maybe take a cold shower, you know. But he could have chosen a different path from that point, yeah? The, the, the thing that dropped in at that moment wasn't sin because it's just presented. It's just there. You can drive down the street and there can be billboards, there can be things. Things can come on the radio, yeah? It's what we do with it next. What David does next, yeah, is he takes that thought, he takes that temptation, he takes that that choice that is before him, and then he says, who is this fine young lady? He goes and inquires of her, so he puts into action something that he's seen. And then what happens from that process is then they say, oh, that's Bathsheba, and she's married. Yeah, so even at that point, it should have been like, oh, it's a no-go zone. Okay, I get it. Okay, you know. And yet he says, oh, that's not going to stop me. And so he finds out who she's married to, puts him at the front line of the battle. In fact, he even says, so he will die. You know, he doesn't even say, 
oh, let's just put him there and it'll look like an accident. He literally is saying, let's, let's do this so he will 100% die. What started off is just a moment that could have been different. He could have just changed his mind and said, I'm not going down that route because I'm a man after God's own heart. Do you remember David? Yeah? So it starts up here. I don't know, maybe it's not as obvious as, obvious as that for us. Maybe the thoughts we have are simple starters, like, I'm not good enough. Yeah? Maybe it's not a naked woman across the street. Maybe it's not a command of God to go and, go and, go and, get a, uh, go and tell a, a person or a people to repent. Maybe it starts off as something so simple, it's just like, I'm not good enough. You know that thought? You know, like I said earlier, that thought that could just come into your mindset in that moment? It's what you do with it next. It's not that it won't come in there. It's what you do with it next. Maybe it's, I hate myself. Just that thought that can come, man, I just hate myself. Maybe you're looking in the mirror one day. Maybe there's just things that you do that you just think, oh, I'm just not a nice person. I just hate myself. Or maybe you just, you feel like, maybe it could be something simple like, maybe I'll text him back. It's just a thought. It's not become anything in that moment. And that text that has been sent to you from whoever it may be is not coming from a good place with good intentions and probably from someone that is honoring God. And you know it. And the choice is it's on there and you have this incredible button called delete. And yet what we do is we start typing. It just started with a thought. It just started with something arriving, but now I'm in a mess. I wonder what happened if I clicked on that website. You know what the website says. You can see it. The, the, the having it presented to you is not the problem. Oh, you don't understand it. It just arrived in my email. It popped up in a comment section. That's not the problem. Don't, don't, don't try and fool yourself by trying to say, like, it was, I couldn't cope with it. You had to put it into action to get the mouse or your finger or whatever it was and click. You had to do that then to access something that was then going to take you down a darker path and end up in a mess. You know when people, um, they, sh they know that maybe they shouldn't go out with a certain person or even a group of people. Maybe it's like, it's your old life, it's, it's whatever. You know if you go there, you've got weaknesses that are going to not help you. Those things can happen too. It's just a thought, it's just an invite, but all you need to do is say no. But when we say yes, maybe we come in the next morning late and we think, oh no, what actually happened? And sometimes we justify it because, well, I'm lonely. God doesn't want me to be lonely because he says in Genesis 2, it's not good for man to live alone, you know? And you justify it with that when God's saying, yeah, but I've got, I'm, I'm sorting it for you. It's on its way. You don't need to do it for, for me. And that, that's not what I've got for you. It starts with a thought. You will find what you seek. Verse 4, but the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so the ship was about to be broken up. And then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, lain down, and was fast asleep. There's this another story in the Bible of a chap that was asleep in a boat during a storm. Has anyone heard it? Yeah, yeah, that's not this story. Yeah, but there's another, there's a parallel. <laughs> Unfortunately for these men, they had Jonah asleep in their boat. 
disciples had Jesus in theirs. Now, a boat is known as a vessel. Do you know what else is known as a vessel? You. You are known as a vessel. Jonah was on his way, on his journey, um, doing it on his own. You know, we know this because God said, can you go do this thing? And he said, no. And so he runs in the opposite direction with the absolute purpose to not be in the presence of God. I mean, Jonah's a prophet. He should have known that he couldn't run from the presence of God. But, but the reality was he had consciously decided a thought first to run from the presence of God, to flee from God, to, to push God away. God hadn't left him, but Jonah had pushed him away. He was on the boat in the storm, and it was just him. There was no Jesus next to him. When the captain came and he looked for help, we're in a storm. It's all going really wrong. Like, ah. They looked. They couldn't see Jesus, but they saw Jonah. And they went, what do we do? Like, what, what's going here? Now Jesus is like, why are you bothering me? Storm, shut up. Yeah? Because of the authority he had and who he was. And Jesus can calm any storm. Can I just say as well, we, we know the picture that Jesus got up and he calmed the storm. But if the disciples truly knew who was in their boat, I really believe that they could have gone through the storm and survived the storm because Jesus was asleep in the boat. I know this, right? I know this because... God doesn't calm every storm in my life. Does he calm every storm in yours? But he helps me through it. Sometimes he calms them. I'm thankful when he calms a storm I don't have to go through. But there are times I have to go through the storm, but he is with me going through it. I believe if they knew, if the disciples really knew who Jesus was at that moment, they would have said, even though this is crazy, and it seems like we're about to die, Jesus is on the boat, it's going to be okay. And as we mature in our faith, I think we learn that more. We learn a little bit more like, it's okay, Jesus is in the boat. And we're telling people that are like, I'm in a storm. And it's like, it's okay, Jesus is in the boat. And they're looking at you like, you're, you're, you're crazy. But you're like, actually, I was just like you once. And actually, sometimes I'm still like you in the future. Because the storms can get bigger and rage and you're like, And then you forget that God did it before and he can do it again. Because you're just like, no, not this storm. This is too big for God, you know? Because our God is greater, our God is stronger, except when the storm is bigger than him, you know? <laughs> There's a saying, isn't there, that if you're not full of God, then you're probably full of yourself. Ooh. Ah. You know? I feel uncomfortable just sitting there. If Jesus is not on your boat, if Jesus is not in your vessel, if Jesus is not in you, you're probably full of you. And you doesn't do you any good. This isn't just about the start of our journey as well. You know, some people will be like, I've been a Christian 35 years, you know, Jesus is totally in my boat. You know, I'm like, come here so I can slap you in a brotherly way. Um, because the truth is, is actually we do this all the time as Christians. And if anyone doesn't, then you're either Jesus or a liar. Okay. Because the reality is we do choose to do it our own way. At times, there are times when we say, God, I've got this. Or God says, you can do this. Can you go do this thing for me? And you're like, no, I'm, I'm not going that way, God. I'm going this way. Literally the opposite way. We all do it. So this isn't just about, oh, is Jesus in your boat now? Are you, are you, are you secure in your salvation? Are you on the narrow path? You know, it's not just about that. It's about you can still choose to put yourself in a ridiculous mess and still be on the narrow path. Still have your eternity assured. 
But as Christians, you can still make dumb decisions. Do you know that? Hallelujah. Amen. Not just me. Yeah? We have Jesus to help us make less dumb decisions, but we're still human beings that are still going to do things like Jonah. <laughs> because when you really find out why Jonah runs, like you're going to be like, what? And then I'm going to go, yeah, we can laugh at Jonah. <laughs> but don't we do the same thing? <laughs> I put, Jesus can sleep through your storms, and he's still more powerful than you <laughs> to guide you through it, you know? Jesus could be asleep. He doesn't even need to pay attention to it. And he's still more powerful than you trying to do it yourself to get yourself through it. I'd rather have a sleeping Jesus in my boat than just me, full of me. Verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and they said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do that you... that?" Um, to you that the sea may calm be calm for us for the sea was growing more tempestuous i will learn that word tempestuous it comes up again in a minute and he said to them pick me up and throw me into the sea then the sea will become calm for you for i know this great tempest is because of me okay jonah he's just like actually this is all happening because of me just throwing me overboard yeah he literally says it like that Nevertheless, because this is what human beings that actually have a bit of a heart will do, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not. Because that is the craziest thing to do, isn't it? Just to throw someone overboard to calm a storm. Has anyone ever seen that happen? You know, like, oh, there's a big storm. It's just, you know, oh, it's raining outside. I'll tell you what, I'll throw my kid outside in the garden, and then it will calm down, you know? Has anyone seen in the history that we just throw somebody out or throw someone in the sea, and then the the sea becomes so calm. It's not normal. You know, these things just happen, don't they? There's, the weather happens. Storms come to, to ships on the sea. To say, throw me in and it will calm is like, that's not, that doesn't happen. So they're like, okay, let's, let's try and not do what he's saying because he sounds crazy, you know? Therefore, they cried out to the Lord because they, hadn't, they were about to die. We pray, O oh Lord, please not let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us with the innocent blood for you O oh Lord, have done as it pleased um, for you. O oh Lord, have done as it pleased for you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea <laughs> ceased from its raging. I wonder if these guys went on to think every storm, they're like, right, who needs to go overboard? <laughs> you know, someone there. <laughs> then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and took vows. Now, I may have mentioned this before in another message. You may have heard this. Um, your sinful actions do not just impact you. When you run from God, it's not just you who suffers. Sin has consequences. These men were just sailors on their way to Tarshish. Yet the sin of one man firstly puts their lives in danger, yeah? But probably way worse than that is that they then had to live for the rest of their lives with the thought, did we just kill a man? Did we, did that man even, did he survive? You know, um, it, there's no recollection in there that they threw even like a rubber ring thing, you know, in there for him. Or that there was a life raft that they threw in. Or even a piece of driftwood, you know, that saved Rose's life at, in Titanic, you know? It's definitely space for two people on that piece of wood, people. <laughs> Anyone else with me on that one? What a selfish human being. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm just saying that he had nothing. They didn't give him anything. They just threw him into a raging sea. Okay, I've never been on a raging sea, you know, um, thank God. Um, but all I'm thinking is, if they thought they were going to die, it's probably not that great. So if you throw someone into a raging sea, you're not throwing in them thinking, 
I hope they got through. You know? I reckon he's all right. You know? <laughs> you throwing him in knowing he ain't coming back. When that thought becomes an action, it leads to consequences that impact and affect others. Think about it. It was just the thought. Oh, do I do what God tells me to do or shall I run in the opposite direction? It's just a thought. Is it a yes? It's a yes or no answer. Do I go God's way or do I not? He chose no. Look at the consequences. Look at how it impacted not just his own life, but others around him. There are people in this room that whilst you know forgiveness and you've probably received healing, you will always be impacted by the sins of others. There will always be something there, a memory, a thought. And vice versa, we're not all innocent in this. None of us here are perfect. But you know what? I'm feeling more and more challenged in my daily walk with God to just try to take that thought and not let it become anything that God doesn't want it to become. You know, like, I think in some ways it's almost like these thoughts that come, like I said earlier, they just come. They're there. It's part of everyday life. That we almost just say, well, that's just life, isn't it? Isn't that just how it works? That we've almost just taken it as just being part of life and then almost being like, oh, okay, I'll just choose to do this thing. Almost just accepting that, okay, that's just it. You know, consequences doesn't matter. It's almost become a, a normal part of life, hurting others, treating others badly, saying the words you shouldn't say, doing the thing you shouldn't do, being nasty to people, putting people down. That all starts with a thought that thinks, do I tell this person that they're actually, I don't like them and they smell? Or do I keep it to myself and work out a way for God to help me do it by his grace and his mercy? Just a thought. It's just a thought. How we treat others starts here. Oh, that's just who I am. I'm just like it. I'm just that kind of person. I'm rude. Well, no. You choose to be. Because it starts with a thought. And I'm being challenged by this all the time. So I'm not talking to you guys like, I'm going to tell all the people here. I'm going to point you all out, all the ones that need to change. This is my challenge. Lord, can you take those thoughts and help me to make sure that they are turned into what you want them to be? And if they're not of you, to just get rid of them immediately rather than open that door? Because you will find what you seek. Just a quick question, just, just a, th a thing for you guys to think on for a second. Is Jesus in your boat? Or is it full of you? And, and maybe it's not just about, it's like, yeah, well, Jesus is in my boat, but there's a bit of me. Maybe there's an area of your life where, like with Jonah, God's saying, can I have this? Can you do this? And you're like, no. Running that way. Is there an area of your life that's full of you that needs to be full of Jesus? It's a rhetorical question, but it's an important question just to think on. Just think on, is there an area of your life that is full of you when it should be full of Jesus? Okay, can I sing for you? Thank you. Someone went, mm. You're going to join in with me. I don't know how this is going to go. Hopefully it'll be better than the whatever I did a few years ago. Um, what's that? The, what did I do last? What was it again last time? Fear of failure exists. Yeah, it's going to be just as bad as that. So, um, I've, I've wrote a song. It's called Prepare Ye the Way of the Lord. Okay? Is that all right? It goes like this. It's prepare ye the way of the Lord. 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 Let's have some beatbox. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. You can clap. 
Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Woo, woo. Let's go. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Why are you not off your seats? Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Let's everyone up. Come on. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. This is going number one. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Woo, 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 woo. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Okay, you can sit down. You can sit down. It's over, it's over. Woo, I have my own keys, Rob. I've been told this before. The keys that I have do not exist. I call that supernatural. <laughs> yeah, they would have walked straight back out, yeah. <laughs> Verse 2, it goes, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Yeah. Um, don't you love it when God prepares the way? Yeah? Yeah? Don't you love it when God prepares things for us? Jesus says, right, he says, I'm going, but I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. Like, I'm thinking, is he, what wallpaper is he picking for my house? You know, like he's preparing a place for me to go and, and be in. Wow. Don't you love it when God prepares something for you? Yeah? Yeah? No? Just me? Yeah? So, no? Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Verse 17. Now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. (laughs) Don't you love it when the Lord prepares things for us? You sure? Oh, I don't know now. I like the house. I like my mansion. I like the song. A little bit. Um, (laughs) The Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. (laughs) When we, when we um, go down the route that we go down, when we choose to come away from God and we do it our own way, God is preparing stuff for us, but it ain't going to be that great. Because it's what he needs to do to steer you back to where you started. And I'd rather have just got on the caravan or the, the, the chariot or whatever, the camel that led to Nineveh, than to be in a stinking, smelly fish. But God, because he's God, will still try and steer you back to where you are, but you're not going to like what he prepared for you. Maybe we should do a new hoodie that says, be careful what you praise, because you guys was praising it with me, about God preparing the way, about seeing God's way being prepared. But maybe we should be thinking, oh, Lord, Don't prepare me a fish. Don't prepare me a fish. Unless you're cooking breakfast for me. (laughs) Or the Sea of Galilee. After the resurrection, I'll take those fish. But that fish, I don't want to sit in that fish, Lord. As we said before, and as people amen, instead of seeking God, Finding God, knocking on the right door, we go in the wrong direction. God, instead of preparing a way for you to travel to Nineveh, he's having to prepare something else just to get you back to where you started. Now, Jesus likens his three days in the grave to Jonah's three days in the fish. Um, when you, when you uh, read on, and we've got in, chap- in verse, I think it's in um, chapter 2 maybe. Maybe chapter 3. It's not that hard to find out. Um, Jonah is praying to God and he says um, about Sheol, which is known as the place of the dead. And he's saying, will you rescue me from this place? Place of the dead. If you choose to run from God, it does not end well. How many people have ended up sitting in the fish sometimes? In that in that place of the dead, like, how have I ended up here? And it all started with just a thought. It just started with, do I go my way or God's way? This is a deep, dark place to get to. And we don't end up here overnight. It's not just a bad decision. You, we make bad decisions every day. We let God down every day. And we have an incredible, gracious, and merciful God that when we come before him, we say, Lord, I am so sorry that I let you down. You are forgiven. You are set free. And you can move forward 
to get into this place, it takes time. It takes a lot of seeking. It takes a lot of asking for something you shouldn't be asking for or something you shouldn't be seeking. The place of the dead. Now, thinking about this, I've, I'm not saying this from experience. I'm just going with Pinocchio, okay? But a giant fish, okay, with its mouth open, okay? Imagine a giant fish with its mouth open, okay? Isn't it look like a bit like a cave? One way in, one way out. And we started a campaign last year, cancel cave culture. Did we not yet? <laughs> it's, it, hasn't got, it didn't get any bigger than this church, but it was a, it was a movement nonetheless. But this, is, this cave I see is one of the darkest of all. It's a dark cave, a stinking cave. And it's one of those caves where you're like, I should have just gone to Nineveh. You know those things? Oh, I should have just not put that thought into action. But it's not the worst place. It's a bad place. It's a dark place. But you, if you get hold of this, for those that are in it, or those that maybe you'll be in it in the future, it can be the beginning of something too. Because sometimes it's when we're in the place of death. In fact, not even sometimes. We need to get to the place of death in order for him to live. How can God fill us fully with him when we empty ourselves of ourselves? And sometimes we've just got to die. Sometimes we've just got to be brought to this place so that we can die, that he might live. Galatians 2.20 is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. This is why I believe this might be a message for someone today because I believe that you're in on some part of this journey away from God and I really believe God wants to bring you back. So we read, seek and you will find. And people went, amen at the beginning, remember that? So long ago now. Ask and it will be given, amen. Lord, that Mercedes, woo. I asked 20 years ago, Lord. <laughs> Knock and the door will be opened. These passages have been used for prosperity. They've been used to kind of just say, you know, actually this is the good side. You know, when we seek God, of course, seek firstly the kingdom of God and all the things will be added to you. You know, it's, 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 it's absolutely a passage where, where we, we use it to seek God. Amen. Amen. But when we read them in the context today... I just want to ask a question. If, if we seek but not God's way, if we ask for something that not, that's not from God, and if we knock on a door that isn't God's, who's answering? Because I think we know enough now in our faith to know when we're knocking on God's door or when we're, we're asking God of, for something or when we're seeking the kingdom of God. So if we're not doing those things, who's answering you? Who's on the other end of the door? Who is the one that is giving you what you seek or giving you what you ask? Because if it's not God, who is it? It could be a mixture of things. It doesn't have to just be Satan. Satan's one of them. It can be you giving you what you want. It can be pleasing other people. It can be being in the camp of the enemy. But if it ain't God on the other end of that door, why do you want to open it? Why do you want to go the other side of it? Why do you want to seek it? 
And I'm not, asking, I'm not saying this to you like, why are you seeking such things? Be like me. <laughs> I'm saying, why do we do that? Why do we do that? Why is it that even though we know God is not at the other end of what we seek, we still seek it? Why is it that when we know that God is not at the other end of what we're asking, we still ask for it? And why is it that we knock on doors that are not God's? We do this. We. You might be thinking of somebody in your head, but you do it too. We all do this. You know, the times I ran from God were the darkest times in my life. I don't know about you, but when I chose not to be where God wanted me to be, I was not in a good place. I was in a belly of a fish. I was being thrown overboard, you know? I was spat out on a beach covered in fish guts. And I looked around and I was like, oh, this is where I started. And I stink now. Okay, so if we're not knocking on the right door, what can be the wrong door? Now, I've just picked out a couple of things. It's not, it's not specific. This, this can be anything. So if you're not listed in here and you know it's still the wrong door, it's the wrong door. Don't just be like, he didn't list it, so I think I'm all right. I'm going to carry on knocking. You know it's the wrong door. I'm just, maybe this is for specifically for someone today. But this one particularly, and, and um, lacking self-worth. A door that has a label on it that says lacking self-worth that might have things like hating yourself, feeling inadequate, not feeling good enough, incapable of believing that anyone can love you. All lies, yet there's a door that exists. According to the word of God, all lies or all things we shouldn't do, hating yourself is the opposite of what God asks us to do. Yeah, love yourself is what he says. So it's either something we shouldn't be doing or it's a lie. And we're believing the lie and we can knock on the door of that. And what's at the other end of it? Self-hatred. For some, maybe self-harm. You become isolated, alone. You will create a place for yourself that leads you away from who God says you are. Yeah? All things that we know. I know, I mean, we're in a church that we usually go, you know, this is who God says you are, yeah? We know who God says, what God says about us, and yet we still believe the lie. It leads us to a dark place, a place of dark thoughts, a place that ends up controlling and manipulating us into feeling that way and accepting that that is just the norm. Maybe that's one of the doors. Maybe the other, one of the doors says lust. You know, I was thinking about the door, particularly in the, the, the world that we're in today. You know, the, the actual knocking on of the door and linking it to lust is literally like almost exactly what is the way that it is today. It's a door that you can knock and it can be opened. It's very accessible now. You know, th anything goes really. You can access anything um, but for lust, it's available. It's a door you can knock, and it's a door that can be opened. If you're on a computer, it can be a window that opens, or a tab these days, I guess. If you're on a dating app, where people are messaging you because they like what they see, because you put the picture on that you liked of yourself, and then they send you a picture of them, and you like what you see, but you realize this person ain't walking with God. It's a door that you can shut or it's a door that you can open. It's that easy. You just swipe left, I think. Maybe right. I can't remember. Is it right? To... What one is it? What is it? <laughs> like, this is where like, everyone's like, it's a... is it swipe right if you like it? Yeah. That's, that makes sense because it's right. Isn't it? Yeah. So, so you just got to swipe right and you're opening a door. That didn't need to open. This can be the same for drugs, drink, watching movies that you shouldn't, hanging out with crowds that you shouldn't. 
This door can be any of those things. It's labeled. It's there. But you have to do something for it to be opened. You have to knock. You know when you know it says, uh, you know, we're sat here and we're thinking, no, yeah, but it's not easy. It's easy for you to say that. Well, actually, I'm in a room, my life, and there's a door to an area of things that are not meant to be opened to me anymore. But it's still there. God doesn't take the door away. It's still there. But I still have to put into action, let's say I'm in the middle of the room, I still have to put into action to walk over to the, ro- the door and knock on whatever label of door that is. When people say I didn't have a choice, yes, you did. Because the thought might start here, ooh, lust. Maybe you're with someone, look over there. And suddenly you're right where you shouldn't be. And now you've got closer, you've just got to knock. When you're here and it's just a thought, you can try knocking. But unless you're, is it like Mr. Fantastic from the Fantastic Four with stretchy arms? You can't knock that door. You have to move into the place to be able to access for that door to be open to you. It's a choice, but it starts with a thought. Okay. Catch this. This, You're going to love this. I know it's been a bit harsh. Revelation 3, verse 20, it says, Behold, this is Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now just go go with me on this, okay? The room is your life, okay? You like symbols, don't you? Pictures, Jess. You're going to love this, okay? The room is your life, okay? We've already spoke about this door, yeah? Whatever that door is for you. And you know what? This is another thing. That door says lust on it right now. God can deliver you from that, yeah? So suddenly that label is no, it's got no power on you. You can have it come at you always. And it's like, I don't need to, I don't even go, need to go and knock on that door. It doesn't bother me anymore. But it will become a different label because Satan will find another thing. Yeah? So, so actually, it's, it's not just like, oh, that's going to be the door that's going to be there for the rest of your life. That door can be conquered. It can go, has anyone seen Monsters, Inc.? Yeah? When the kids grow up, they get rid of the doors. It's, yeah? It's like God shreds those doors. When he delivers you, the door gets shredded. It's got no more power over you. Okay? But the reality of it is it can change the name. It can just change the name. It can be something else. Okay? It's never going to go away because the enemy is always going to have the things to come and tempt you with. And it will be a choice for you to walk there and to knock. And to, for, for that door to be opened, you have to knock. Okay? All right? Now picture this. You're in a room now. There's not just one door. There's two doors. There's another door here, okay? There's another door here. And one is labeling, the one we've just spoken about, lacking self-worth, I'm unlovable, addiction, lust, sex, failure. What's the point? That could be on the door, yeah? Why am I even here? Why am I even bothering with living? That could be on the door. Why? There's no purpose to me. If I just knock the door, it will all be over. Yeah? That door has some horrific labels on it, but they only have power if first you allow the thought to become an action and then that action to become a knocking. That will then allow that door to be opened. It's a promise. You see, we take it from God's point of view, knock on his door and it will be opened. But scripture tells me you knock on any door and it will be open. It's just who's on the other side. Okay. But this one's got two doors. I did tell you that. Now this door, it looks good. And you know what? It's a wide door too. And it looks good. It's not even like, ooh, that's sin. I don't like it. It looks all horrible. It doesn't look like that. It looks good. It tastes good. It's entire. Ooh, I can feel it. This door. Yeah? That's what temptation towards sin is. It looks good. 
until you taste it, and then you fall. Amen. <laughs> Someone likes a bit too much of that fruit. But on the other side of the room, there is a door, and there is a knocking. Now, this one, you've got to knock on. You've got to actually knock on this door, and this door will be open to you. But on this one, it ain't you that's knocking. Maybe it gets more urgent because you are moving this way, and suddenly it's like... Yeah? Because you're... You're actually a little bit closer to doing your own knocking. But, but maybe you missed this because I missed it the first time I read it. <laughs> Not only is Jesus knocking. Listen. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice. Jesus isn't just trying to get you away from here. By knocking. He's calling you by name. And he's probably doing this as you walk to the place of lacking self-worth and feeling, I'm, I hate myself. I'm not worthy. How can anyone love me? He is knocking. And he's also saying, I love you. You're worthy. You're worthy. I created you for a purpose. Just please, please don't. Walk back this way. And there's a choice. There's a choice here. Do we knock on what is easy? Or do we open what is hard? Because this door, by the way, is narrow. It's a narrow, ugly, doesn't look like much door. But the preciousness is not in the path or in the door. It's who you're on, who's on the other side of the door. Because on the other side of this one, yes, it's the one that leads to destruction. But this one has life. And for some reason, this one is so much harder to open than it is to knock on this one. You are in a place where you can do what is easier, what is more pleasing to the flesh. You can knock on that door and you don't even have to open it. You don't even have to turn the handle. You need to knock it. Satan, lust, is on the other side of this door waiting for your knock. And it's like, come in, child. Come in and enjoy everything I have for you. That, that horrible, mean God won't let you have. Come in. Come and have everything you could ever have. Satan is absolutely waiting for you to knock. He's at that door hoping. But he has no power. Think. He can't open the door unless you knock. And Jesus is knocking. I love you. Don't, don't accept that text. Don't let that person into your life. That's not the person I've got for you. I'm a good father with good gifts. It's on its way. It might not come the way you think. It might not come in the timing you think. But just trust me because that door isn't going to give you what you want. Open this one. He's calling your name. In the same passage that I read earlier from Matthew, in verse 13, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. It starts with a thought. And this is our walk with God. This is our walk with God. This isn't, 
This isn't just a one time only, get this right, you're okay. This is literally what our life looks like. We're in the room of our life. That is never going away, but it's a choice. And he is always knocking. Jesus is always knocking. And all you've got to do is open the door. Can I just do a bit of a demonstration? So, so when, when we knock, we have to clench our fist. Yeah? We have to clench our fist. We have to put our hand into an action to then put it into this action. Jesus is knocking on the door, but instead of having a clenched fist, maybe we're angry. Maybe we're just tired. Maybe we're just fed up. You know, clenching the fist, what it represents. We're just so angry, God. And God is saying, let me have that. Open your hand. And now you can open the door. Because you can't, has anyone ever tried opening a door with a fist? No. Try it when you go home. You're going to look like a fool. Make sure someone videos it and sends it to me. <laughs> but this is a representation of what we do, our holding everything in. The pain and the hurt, the abuse, the anger, all the things that might lead us to this door are here. And all I've got to do is already there because this life has done it to me. And it's, I'm ready to knock. I'm ready to knock because... Life, life hurts. Life, life, life isn't fair. All I've got to do is knock, and I can end my life. All I've got to do is knock, and I can be in a relationship that will meet my flesh. All I've got to do is knock, and I can hate myself for the rest of my life. Because I'm so angry. I'm so upset. And Jesus is saying, just let go. Now you can open the door. Now you can open the door. And he's knocking. I don't know who needs to hear this message today. But I believe it's for everyone. But I believe it might be for someone who is in this place right now. And they're edging more to that door than they are to that one. God says, come on. Let go. Open the door. And let me in. How does this start? How do we end up in the cave? How do we end up being thrown overboard? How do we end up knocking on doors that we shouldn't be knocking on? How do we get there? I'll tell you how scientifically proven is called stupidity. Some of the dumbest reasons for why we end up in the darkest of places start with the dumbest thought. You know, some people say, oh, I'm not. You know, people have people around them. Sometimes, and they can be, and it's not like, you know, sometimes people say, I was in a room full of people, and I was the loneliest one there, you know, those kind of things, you know, but actually, when you have people around you, the truth is, people love you, they love you, they love you, God loves you more, God loves you more, there's like, regardless of whether you have friends or not, it's nice to have friends and family, 100%, regardless of that, you are loved, so when you say, I'm not loved, no one can love me, it's called a lie, yeah, You're, you're already lying. When you say that I hate myself, maybe, maybe you say that, you're doing the opposite of what God is asking you to do. You're choosing to knock on a door you shouldn't be knocking on. How do we get there? Stupidity. Because we know it, don't we? I mean, we do know it. I mean, if you're new in your faith, maybe there's, you're learning. But for most of us, we know who God says we are, don't we? We know what he says we are, what he says about us. How does it start? Stupidity. So, look, get this. It says, uh, chapter 4, but it displeased Jonah. Oh, sorry. So, basically, he gets there. He tells them. They go, okay, we don't want to upset God. What do we need to do? They repent. 600,000 people, they believe, like, turns to God. Okay? You're a prophet, right? You're a prophet. Your job is literally to see the kingdom of God, like to bring the voice of God and see whatever it is that God wants come to fruition. And he, this is Jonah's response to that, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, ah, Lord, 
Was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish. For I know, and this is the bit you need to get hold of. You may be in the darkest of places. You may have knocked on this door way too many times, okay? But you need to know something about my God, okay? Because Jonah knew about God. And this is Old Testament as well, okay? You know when people say God was a bit angry in the Old Testament, okay? And he was a bit miserable. And he just was like, he just like flooded things and burnt things. And he just seemed to have real anger issues. But then Jesus came along and it was all about love after that. Well, this is an Old Testament scripture. And this is what Jonah says about our God, okay? He says, I know that you are a gracious a merciful God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. <laughs> you want to know how Jonah went on this journey of stupidity that led to darkness? It started with him going, even though I agree that Nineveh is a sinful city, and I don't like them, because they're Gentiles, and they don't deserve it. I'm in agreement. Yes, they're wicked. But I'm not going to go where you tell me to go, God, because I know how merciful and gracious and how abundant your loving kindness is that you will save them, and I don't want you to save them. <laughs> and that led him to being thrown overboard, impacting a bunch of sailors for the rest of their lives, and sitting in a stinky fish. And isn't that us? <laughs> Don't we end up in some of the darkest places that when we retrace our steps, you think, man, that was the dumbest reason. <laughs> that was the dumbest reason. So I want to say to you, if you're in this belly of the fish, or you're being thrown overboard, or you're just starting on the journey to pay your fare to get away from God's plan, I want to say to you, there is a God that loves you. His mercy and his grace and his loving kindness are abundant for you. This is not a condemning message. This is a message of hope. To say you may be in the dark right now, but God is making a way. And you might not like what he's preparing, but it will set you back on track. If you let him. Nearly there. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah doesn't answer. So Jonah went out of the city, sat on the east side of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, and he sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. I don't know if he sat there thinking, let's just see if this goes wrong. I don't know. But he sits outside. He doesn't even go and enjoy it. He was born to be a messenger of God, to see people impacted by the power of God. And he, instead of sharing in that incredible testimony, in that moment, rejoicing with those who had been saved, he left and he exited what God was doing and he sat a miserable old fart <laughs> on the outside of the city Maybe just waiting to see if this was really God or if he was right in the first place. Sorry. And the Lord God prepared a plant. <laughs> God prepared him a plant. You know about the God preparing the way? Yeah. God prepared him a plant that made, that made it come up over Jonah that it might shade his head to deliver him from his misery. Yeah, you thought I was being rude when I called him a misery far. It's, it's a little bit of paraphrase, but it says it here. You know, he was miserable. Miserable. He was miserable. And so God makes him a plant to cover his head because it's hot. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. <laughs> but as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm. And so it damaged the plant and it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind. You don't want God preparing these things. 
But this is what God will have to prepare to get you out of your misery, to get you out of where you are um, being out of obedience to what he's asked you to be and to do. These are the things that God, I rather God would prepare a house for me. That's what I want Jesus to focus on. Jesus, don't prepare me any fish. Don't prepare me any east wind. And don't get any worms to eat my plants. Can you just carry on building, preparing my house for when I see you? Focus on that, please. The reality of it is, if we choose to run from God, God is never going to leave you, but he's going to have to prepare all sorts of weird things to get you back on track. Okay. Do you know the other thing? I, I read this. This is um, somebody um, people believe, is that when he was in the fish, there would have been some kind of bleaching kind of thing that would have happened to him. So actually his skin would have been impacted by being in the fish. So actually when he came out and he sat in the sun, it was way worse than it should have been. This is what happens when we sin. There are more consequences than you think. And the impact of what you've done still lasts long after you've done it. Doesn't mean you're not forgiven. It doesn't mean you can't be healed. And it doesn't mean you can't move forward but it does mean that there can still be a lasting impact from the decisions you make away from God's purposes. I'm nearly there. Jonah was miserable, and so life got more miserable. If you seek it, you'll find it. You know those people that are miserable? Don't look at them. Okay. Yeah? Do you realize they just get more and more miserable? Seek it, you'll find it. Seek it, you'll find it. Then Jonah said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it's right for me to be angry, even to death. I'm angry about the plant. We can end up running from God for the dumbest of reasons, like I said earlier. But please, can you just get hold of this? And this is a serious question to ask yourself because it's not just something you should just say yes to. It's something you need to say yes to because you believe it. Is your life no longer yours? Don't answer me. Think about it. Is your life no longer yours? Because I believe Jonah thought he had a a choice in this. You know, almost like, oh, I can negotiate with you, God. Could, I don't like this assignment. Can you give me the next assignment? I'll be in Tarshish at the beach. Send me the next, you know, this next assignment then. And God's saying, no, this assignment isn't just about this city. This has always been about you. God is leading you on paths and on journeys for you. It's not just to save others. It's because it's the journey you go on together with him. And when he says this, go, he he means it for a reason. So when we say, I'm not doing it, God's saying, well, we're going to have to still do it. So you can go and do what you want. You can go over there, but we're still going to have to get to this place. Now, this is something that um, Ian brought um, to the men's group about three weeks ago. We listened to a message from a guy, and he said something along the same lines. (laughs) This isn't my life. It's not mine. It's not my life. It's not my, this isn't yours. This is actually not yours. You know that? When you accepted Jesus into your life and you chose to follow him all the rest of your days, this, which you say, oh, it's just this battlefield, which it is, is still his. If you surrender this more to him, it will be less of a battlefield. But if you see it as yours, you're going to be battling a lot more than you should. This is not yours. If you're being governed by this, your way, there's a lot of feeling that gets involved. And not always good. But if it's God's heart, is this his or is it someone else's? Is this his or is it someone else's? Is this your feet and your hands, the action? Is it his or is it yours? If we don't get hold of this understanding that God is God, like God is God, 
I've just told you he's an incredible God because he's knocking at the door and he's calling you by name and he wants to come into your life and he wants to have fellowship with you and he loves you and he loves you and he loves you. I can't say it more than that. But he's also God on high. The most high God. The earth is his footstool. We are like ants. He is mighty and he is great. We can't just open the door to Jesus and all the lovely things that come with what he brings. We also have to accept that he is God. And that this is no longer yours. And I, that message that you brought that day in, it's changed the way I think about me. The way I think about the things that um, the flesh might want or the mind might want. It just goes, well, that's not my mind. It's, I mean, it's been that easy, seriously. But it's not mine. It's not my body. It's not my thoughts. It's his thoughts. My thoughts aren't his thoughts. My ways aren't his ways. It will change your life if you can get hold of this. It's no longer yours. Right at the end. We're right at the end of the whole book now. <laughs> but the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant. I wonder if we have more pity on materialistic things, on other things than we do on the fact that people's souls can be saved. You know, just a question, you know, but, but if you think about it, he had more pity on the plant, which he did not labor nor make grow. And it came up at night and it perished at night. Should I not pity Nineveh, the great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and the left hand. What that meant is there was 120 young children there, which is why they estimate is maybe 600,000 people that were in that city. And Jonah was like, I'm more bothered about the plant that was covering my head, and I'm angry about that more than I am, but this city is now rejoicing because they found God. But question, this is, this is how it ends. I've never seen this. And maybe there's another, other books in the Bible. But it says, verse 11, it says, And should I not pity that great city in Nineveh in which there were more than 120,000 people cannot discern between right and wrong, and their left and their, um, and their left, and much livestock, question mark, the end. Is anyone else reading the Bible right now? Yeah? Do you see how it ends? God asking a question he doesn't need an answer to. Yeah? This is how I see it. This is how I see it. Because he's God, okay? He is God. I don't know where he is in your life right now, but he is meant to be God the most high, okay? So this is what I see. This is what I think God did to Jonah in this moment. He had one of these, okay? And he said, is it better for you to, like, love the plant more than the people? And you're telling me that I shouldn't be loving these people? When there are 120,000 children there and you would be more happy if I'd wipe them out than to save them you see he's asking a question it's a rhetorical question because he's I think from this point I've, I've looked it up there's not much else on Jonah after this point but I think this is because Jonah just stood there and went <laughs> got nothing to that and I like to think that maybe it was enough to turn Jonah Maybe it was enough. I don't know. I, this is just theory. I like to think that God did this. He mic dropped him. Yeah? You know when you like, you say a load of stuff. There's rap battles they have, you know? And they drop the mic and sometimes people are like, I've got nothing. Yeah? This is what God did to Jonah. And this is what God does to us. When he says something and he's God in your life and he says it and he mic drops you, he's not looking for a debate. And he's not asking for you to question it. He's just asking for you to believe it and maybe to do it. Is he that God to you? Just a question. Is he that God to you? Where he can drop the mic and you're not there going, yeah, but you didn't listen to my opinion on it, Lord. I dropped the mic so that you can move on. There's nothing else here to say. I've already pointed out that your mind is not in the right place. Your heart is not in the right place. Let's sort that out first. Yeah? He leaves it with an unanswered question. Because that's our God. Because he should have the final word. 
I just want to pray um, because obviously the message today is about seeking and finding things when you're looking in the wrong place. Seeking God leads to opening the door and having Jesus in your life. But seeking the things that you shouldn't be seeking is still a promise. The door will be opened. You will find it. It will come. So my challenge to you today is, what are you seeking? What are you asking for? And what doors are you knocking on? And if they're not connected to God, and they're not being driven by God, God wants to rescue you from that place right now. If you're watching online, or anyone watches this later on, please respond to this. Because this will change your life. Like what Anne's talking about is what it leads to. An unselfish way of living. But this message is about the selfish way of living. And that we don't need to be doing it. Because there is a God that has so much mercy and so much grace. And he loves us so much. And he is just knocking and he's knocking and he's knocking. And maybe in the picture in your head, maybe, I don't, I'm sorry for putting this in your head, but I, maybe it would change your life. Maybe it would save your life. But maybe just picture that. Picture the next time you go to click on the internet thing that you're not meant to, or the app that you're not meant to be on, or to start going into a place of speaking death over your life about how unworthy you are and how, how much you suck in life and what's the point in being here. Why don't you picture in your head at the same moment that Jesus is knocking on the door and the choice to go one way or the other is always there. Always. You need to know. Think about this. You're about to click on a website you shouldn't be clicking on. Jesus is calling your name at the same time. Think about it. Don't do it, Rich. Don't do it. Open your hand and come open this door instead. Think about it. I'm not worthy. I'm rubbish. I have no worth. What is the point in living? He is telling you at the same time you're about to knock on that door that's about to be open. You are worth everything to him. I would like you to get that picture in your head. And maybe let that be the picture that dictates the choices that you make when you go forward. Jesus is knocking on a door that you have to open. Satan is ready to open a door that you have to knock on. So I want to give people the opportunity here. Maybe you're running from God. Maybe you just started to run from God. If you are, praise God for that because you can catch this early. Okay? Maybe you're on a ship already, but there is a raging storm that has been created. Not because it's just life, but because of the consequences of your sin. And you're like, I'm in a right mess. Maybe you're sat in the belly of a fish. Or maybe God has just spat you back out on the beach. And you're there, having experienced this horrific thing. But now you still have a choice. Do you go on to do what God wants you to do? Or do you go through all that again? So if you're in this place, whether you're watching online, or whether you're in this room right now, if you're in a place and you just want someone to stand with you and pray with you, so that you don't have to sit in that fish a moment longer, or be in that storm a moment longer, these aren't life storms. These are self-inflicted storms. These are things you've created that you don't need to be in any longer. You just need to say, I'm not walking that way anymore. I'm opening this door. 